All right, we are going to go ahead and start because it's past time now. The name of this presentation, which is not shown on the screen because I decided not to load up the PowerPoint, which I did make, uh, can Perl be used to create video games? And um, <clears throat> before I give you the answer to that question, which is neither exactly yes nor no, um, I will introduce myself and say greetings, Perl citizens. My name is Will the Chill. Some of you may know me by my legal name, Will Braswell. Sorry if I sound a little stuffed up. It's one of the 17 Texas allergy seasons. I forget which one we're in. I think it's third summer, even though summer just started four or five days ago. Uh, okay, so I did, I made a PowerPoint and then I was like, well, there's no time to go through a PowerPoint. So we're just gonna go straight through the source material only. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, pearlcommunity.org. It's a website that we um, have created to showcase various aspects of the Pearl community. Um, look at that, maybe it looks a little better. Uh, video games is one of those aspects. Uh, other aspects, the office suite, mobile things and so forth, but we're not talking about any of that here. Um, I'm just using this in lieu of a first slide, but I, I do want to draw attention to the fact that uh, uh, we need to market whatever games we have better, which we're not doing right now. So that's kind of what this talk is about to kind of get started towards that. So um, I actually did make one slide that I'm gonna do by memory because it's kind of important. What are the components of a video game? Well, you need input. That's like keyboard, mouse, joystick, whatnot. You need output. That's gonna be audio and video or virtual reality or augmented reality. Um, you need Players, which are going to be, it's like a single player game, is it a multiplayer game, is it a network player game? Uh, you're going to need characters for your players to be, you're going to need non-player characters for the computer to play and so forth. Um, you need the gameplay itself, which is, you know, the rules, the levels, the turns, the inventory objects and weapons or whatever your game has as gameplay. Um, and then you need the plot. That's your storyline development, character development, um, the locations of where it's all happening. It might even fit into a larger genre, or it might might even fit into a larger pre-existing universe if you're making a game based off of some uh, other thing that someone's already come up with or that you've already made in the past. So that was probably the most important slide because it didn't contain any other source material. It was just me doing background on why I'm talking about the stuff I'm talking about. Okay, so let's see if I can do this. Yes, that's convenient. It's like a PowerPoint, but it's just tabs in a browser. Uh, this is probably the oldest still relevant piece of uh, online Perl game uh, sort of reality. This is a, it's a GitHub group and it relates to SDL development and other aspects of Perl game development. So um, you can see that, that the, uh, these things, some of them are still being updated regularly and we'll talk about SDL and so forth in a minute. A couple alien bindings to help you get C libraries loaded up, which you'll need for game development. Um, and then just some out of date stuff that no longer applies, but uh, nevertheless, this is still an active group, and if you are interested in developing games in Perl, you should at least look at this because you're going to probably need some of the stuff, specifically like the SDL stuff. So um, it's uh, Perl Game Dev on GitHub, and that's it's not a user, I guess it's a group. So uh, that's just the beginning point. Um, from here, we're going to talk about OpenGL and SGL, briefly. The, uh, we are now uh, in the, the past of Perl Gaming. I'll tell you when we get to the current or present of Perl Gaming, and then for a few minutes I'll briefly talk about the future stuff that doesn't exist yet. So this is old stuff, 2016, OpenGL and SDL. So the Open Graphics Library um, is a more generic... Uh, 
library that you can use to sort of uh, program, program graphics from scratch, and it doesn't have to be game related. It could be anything. It's just that this happens to be something that you can use for games, okay? You could program a video player using OpenGL. You could program a simulator using OpenGL or any other thing that needs graphics. Um, this is the old OpenGL library. Remember, we're in the past at this time, okay? So this is like 2016 stuff. Um, the old version of SDL is not that old. I, this is actually the version that I've been using. Uh, you probably don't want to use the old version of OpenGL because it binds to the old C version of OpenGL. Um, you can go ahead and use the old SDL because it's still relevant and works good. Um, the SDL has two meanings. The meaning that it does not apply in this talk, although it is related to gaming and is important to know, is the scene description language. This is not scene description language. You may come across scene description language if you're into programming games, but that is not what this SDL stands for. This SDL is simple direct media layer. Completely different. Okay, confusing because it is an identical TLA, three letter acronym, SDL. But for pretty much all the purposes of working with Perl stuff, SDL is gonna be the simple direct media layer. Now, SDL is not a Perl only thing. It's again like a C library and these are interfaces to those external C libraries. And fortunate for us, Perl is written in C, so it is possible to mix this stuff in just like we do with every other excess based piece of cool fast Perl code. So um, there's a ton of subcomponents to SDL that you're going to need to use. Um, SDL event. Uh, this is like when something happens like a keyboard event or any other event. It doesn't have to be user input, um, but it could be a keyboard or a mouse or other things. You're going to need something to, that can be triggered on events because most games maybe are not event driven, but many games are event driven, maybe even most, and most games are gonna at least need to have event handling. You know, and that event could be anything. It could be an enemy hitting you. It could be a random timer that goes off. It could be, you know, your spaceship has flown too far or whatever. Any of these things can be events. I'm just making them all up. It's a generic event, but you're gonna need that. Um, you're also going to need uh, to be able to control the video. This is things like loading um, graphics files and sprites and stuff like that. SDL video, uh, SDL mouse, obviously for being able to control the cursor. Okay, you're going to need that. You may not need this. Actually, I use it for some of them, but I don't. If I'm not using a mouse for programming a game or something, then don't use this. You don't need it. So if you need the mouse, use it. Um, SDLX app. This one is kind of one that encompasses a lot of other ones. Okay. Um, what you're probably going to want to do at some point is focus on this one that subsumes most of the other stuff I just talked about. So SDLX is kind of like MooseX or DibX or whatever. It's the extensions of the core SDL. And in this case, it's giving you a framework for creating your application. So could you write an SDL application in Perl without using this? Absolutely, sure. You're just going to be reinventing the whole new ad hoc framework for yourself to create SDL applications when you don't need to do that. And I never did that because I don't want to reinvent this particular wheel. So I use SDLX app. You should too if you want to just kind of get it working. So this will, this will, you're still going to have to do use SDL use SDL event, use SDL mouse, all those other ones I just showed you. But at the end, you're going to do use SDLX app, and that's going to be the one that you mostly interface with when you're writing your code. So I'm, <laughs> I don't have nearly enough time to try and teach you any of this stuff. I'm just kind of showing you what's out there. SDL text, you're going to need that if you want to write text on your screen as part of your stats of the game or labels or whatever. Okay, there's, this is a super old article from Ars Technica that someone wrote, but it's still totally important and valid. I mean, a lot of these, oh, Perl has not radically changed in quite some time. 
and I'm still waiting for Pearl 7, and it's not going to be a radical change there. Maybe if we have Corinna, but that it's not actually changing the way that like old existing Perl code works. So all this stuff should still work just fine. And, and you're going to want to go ahead and read this article because it, it shows you sort of how the original Perl game development stuff worked. And you'll probably be able to figure out, well, that, that piece sounds old and it is old because when you look it up on CPAN, it's going to be the ones that I showed you. That's like 2016. But nevertheless, He's got little graphics that show all of it, and forgive the overabundance of, of advertisements here, but uh, he's got graphics that show sort of what his game, he's got all the code there um, and links to uh, what the end uh, product looks like, dropping bombs on yourself and adding background graphics and stuff like that. So this is a very useful primer, even if it is out of date, useful enough to be mentioned in this talk, Ars Technica. Frozen Bubble, what in the world is Frozen Bubble? Frozen Bubble is the number one most iconic game ever written in Pearl. If you've never heard of Frozen Bubble, I'm here to tell you this is the pinnacle of Pearl game programming and it still is downloadable and runs great after all this time. Don't believe me? Well, I thought you might just say that. So let's give it a spin. Oh, come on, don't give me that. Yes, okay, it's because I put went into full screen mode. It blinked out there for a second. I sure hope this friggin' thing is still recording. <sighs> Todd left, so he can't tell me if it is. <laughs> but if it's not, I'll be ticked off. Can somebody look at the front of this thing and see if it actually has a little recording indicator? It's a red light on, great. Let's take that as it's recording. Okay, this is just showing us a demo right now, so I guess I don't even need to try and play it myself. If you were up here, you could hear it has little pew pew, cool little sound effects. Um, this is on the highest graphics mode. It has lower graphics modes for slower machines, um, but this was all designed, you know, 10 years ago. So it'll run great on whatever you've got. Um, you can do a LAN game. You can do a two person local or one person game. It has a built in level editor. Like I said, it has multiple layers of graphics. Uh, if we just start a one man game, then it gives me my little guy right here, and then I can pew, shoot this, and try and aim it and, uh, you know, get those bubbles to crash and go down. So, I'm showing this not because I think you need to go play this game, but because this, again, is the most well-known, widely played, and sort of advanced by way of graphics programming Perl game. So, it may seem like, well, geez, this is just another Tetris or Dr. Mario clone, Yes, obviously it is, or whatever Candy Crush thing that the kids have played in the last few years. But uh, it, nevertheless, if you want to look at some source code and see how to program a real hardcore Pearl game, this is your best bet. Okay, my name, you don't need my name because I'm not playing that anymore. Come on and switch back. Yes, okay. Great, so that is Frozen Bubble. You definitely want to go check them out because if you don't know and haven't played Frozen Bubble, then you don't know anything about Pearl Games. You can actually see at the very top in this tiny little uh, area right here, it says that it has eight game servers. Nobody's playing right now, but I guess they do still have eight LAN servers running after over 10 years, which is pretty impressive. Uh, okay, so that's Frozen Bubble, and we're moving right along because we this is a short talk. Lacuna Expanse. Lacuna Matata. Oh, wait, that's a different thing. Uh, this is an, another old game, okay, made by JT Smith. And uh, it's, it's an online game. I have not played it. And I'm not going to try and get into playing it right now. But it does have cool stuff. Uh, well, it has a trailer. Uh, it has gameplay and screenshots. Um, but uh, nevertheless, you can... You can look into this and, and try and play it. It's old, but it's still online. Um, and uh, it, it, the, the website of it looks eerily familiar to another new game we're going to talk about in a minute. But first, this game was taken by JT after he made it into a video game. And then he wrote some code, which we'll talk about in a minute, that that interfaces with his other software called the Game Crafter, 
which is for making board games. And what he did was he fed, you can see how the, the board, he's got a ton of board games that people have made using his software. And this thing, uh, I don't even know if this YouTube is gonna load, but if it, if it doesn't, that's fine. Basically, it's a way of, uh, it's, a, it's a software interface for helping uh, developers create their own games. So you can look into this, it's uh, card games, uh, board games, and so forth. But what he did was he wrote some Perl code, which you can see bits and pieces of it here, and he fed in all of his graphics and cool stuff that he had made for the video game and had it auto-generate, you can see as it's going through here, auto-generate a board game for Lacuna Expanse. So there is now a board game and a video game. The board game being mostly auto-generated by Pearl. The original game being written in Pearl and the game generating software, the game crafter being written in Pearl. So this is a trifecta of Pearl gaming goodness all by this one cool guy, JT. In fact, uh, I was surprised to learn that the Game Crafter is still an active force within the board game community. There's board game conventions, just like we have the Pearl Conference here, and they host um, a uh, like a board game night uh, for the Game Crafter. So I know that board games are not video games, but there's an overlap here, obviously, a direct overlap. So. Anyway, you can check all this out. It's it's really cool. There's JT. I have not seen him in a while, but uh, he's still active. Like I said, that the the last thing I saw was that the uh, board game convention didn't happen for several years due to COVID, just like this. And then they came back this year for the first time, just like we are here now. And JT was there with his company doing it. So they are still active even now. So that's cool. That's good to know. <laughs> even though this was written 10 years ago, by JT. Okay, uh, so moving on. Oh yeah, I have written a few little games. Really, they're more of scientific applications, but uh, I'm not gonna bother running them. This is a solar system simulator. It does accurately simulate the movement of the heavenly bodies in our solar system. You could plug in any other heavenly bodies with their own physical attributes and run that as a simulator as well. You can see the little text labels, those are using SDL text that I mentioned before, but yeah, they spin around and, and so forth. Uh, you could use that to create a, a video game, you know, space simulator game or something, I guess, right? So totally doable. That is like a little miniature physics engine that I wrote. I forgot to mention that part of the gameplay aspect is physics engines in games where there are laws of physics. Um, also, I created a Mandelbrot uh, and Julia Fractal Explorer. You can, uh, this is not running, this is just a screenshot, but you could like click anywhere on the Mandelbrot and it'll render the Julia that pertains to that part. And it'll also let you zoom in and out and fly around and stuff. So not exactly a game per se, since it doesn't have rules and gameplay, but again, could definitely be used to make a game and showcases SDL in a simplified manner. So if you really want to learn about SDL and SDLX app and that stuff I mentioned, you can look at these apps and they might be a little bit simpler than trying to crack open something like Frozen Bubble, which is going to be way more everything, code, artifacts, blah, blah, blah. Um, I will also mention that these two that I wrote are completely compilable using the R Perl optimizing Perl compiler. And thus they run far, far faster than any of the other games that we're talking about here. Okay. Moving on. Now we are into present day. That was all past. That was the past, the ghost of Pearl Gaming of Christmas past. So the ghost of Pearl Gaming Christmas present, uh, there is now an OpenGL modern. It's only slightly newer than the old OpenGL one, but it's critically important because it's actually binding to the new versions of OpenGL C libraries, right? So, and it's probably not the oldest version of that at all either, but if you needed something to get you closer to using the latest version of the OpenGL C libraries, this would be your starting point. You could probably just upgrade this with a few more bindings. There is now also SDL2 bindings for Perl. 
SDL2 FFI specifically. And this is in active development. You can see it's just a few months ago was the latest release. So, and this is like a partial implementation as well. I think it's, it would need work to have every possible thing enabled. Um, the old SSL library, I believe, is far more fully featured. So you would probably only use this if there was something in the SDL2C library that you had to have. I would suggest you start with the regular SDLX app and those things I talked about before, just to get used to them before wading into this. I have never used SDL2 or OpenGL2 bindings for Perl, so I can't even tell you if they really work right. All I know is that the original stuff does. <clears throat> Board streams. This one is uh, written by Alexander Carolus. Uh, he's not Carolus. It's K-A-R-E-L-A-S. I apologize, Alexander. I don't know the correct way to pronounce your Greek last name. Uh, so he's a, a buddy of mine on, on Facebook, and he's a, a well-known pro programmer, um, and he is doing WebSocket stuff. So BoardStreams is uh, his WebSockets demo that he's using. And I actually played it with him once. It's like a game of checkers or backgammon or something, but it's WebSockets with two people playing with Perl as the back end and the browser as the front end. So it's super simplified. It's really just a demo. The demo is not running now, but you can check it out on BoardStreams if you want to. Carolcom.net is his main website, um, and it links to this. Uh, then the next one we had, okay, I did promise that there would be a website that looked eerily similar to the, the, uh, Lacuna Expanse. So Lacuna Matata, we've got Tau Station, the newish game by, uh, Curtis Ovid Poe and his team. Curtis was supposed to be here, but he lost his passport. I have never played Tau Station, but we're going to go ahead and try. All right, what is my baseline? I don't know, but I am assuming it's interlinked. I'm just a normal human. Okay, I'm a baseline human. They're going to call me basics, but whatever. Um, all right, well, I'm going for beard, although I prefer to have hair. Oh, wait a minute, there's other options here? Okay, well, I'm not going to be any of those people. I'll go with Beardo. Final step. What should be my character name? I'm open to non-offensive suggestions. Oh, geez, so boring. Okay. Yeah, choose my real handle. This character description, uh, nah, we'll skip that. All the animation stuff is on. Create character. Please match the requested format. Oh, no spaces. Okay, we'll use my IRC version. <sighs> Create character. Is it going? I don't know. Please match the requested format again. 420 characters. A to Z. Did I screw something up here? Howdy. Will the chill. Create character. Okay, well, I don't know. Will the chill. 23. Well, we're stuck. We can't get past this screen. It was going to be a live demo after all, and I figured something would go wacky. So there you have it. I did not write this code, but we can now report to code Curtis that we tried to create a character in Tau Station. And uh, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So uh, either way, it's, it's not working. So that's Tau Station. It's an it's a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. It's not a video game in the sense of Frozen Bubble where things move around and you're changing the angle of a spaceship to fly. I think it's like a turn-based or some sort of RPG style game. I've never played it, but there is a very interesting blog post that's called Tau Station Considered Dangerous. And it's written by a video game person who started playing and could not quit for several months. So um, I'm not going to try and play this game. I have not played any video games since college when I created my own first-person shooter and uh, games lost their, their mystique. But um, I still have a soft spot in my heart for Mario 1 through 3. 
And, uh, and I still think video games are super critically important because it's, they're so popular that if you don't have a showcase of games for any language or system, then you're missing out. Okay. Um, last but not least, Debian Pearl Digital Detective. This is not a game. This is all stuff that may come. Oh, I do have one other thing. This is not last. This is second to last. Um, but this is a book. It's a cool graphic novel, comic book, whatever you want to call it. I think Lionsgate may be working on an animated thing. And uh, I don't know of anyone working on a game, but it should be. So I will now give my final, I believe that's it. Uh, yep, that was my final uh, slide on there. And I do have one other cool thing to tell you all about. It is the ANSI game engine. Sean Holland, a very cool pro programmer, has created the ANSI game engine. And essentially this is a, a really cool thing where it's all using ANSI graphics, essentially characters that are with color codes. Um, it has, uh, this is actually a picture of New Zealand, I believe, where he lives. So this is auto-generated bird's eye view map. You can click on any spot of that map and end up with um, a, I guess this is kind of, it's a, it's a side view version of sort of a uh, mining game. And uh, he also has a live video encoder that uh, he has, you can see himself here encoded as ANSI characters in our video chat that we were doing, which is insane. He, he also has been uh, encoding other videos, like here's a race car driving and so forth. Um, and there are uh, side scrolling levels, like you can see here, like a, oh, sorry, this is like a two and a half dimension level with the sprites that move around and so forth. There's so much in this that I can't and cannot get into, but this is unreleased code. So it's sort of in the present slash future, okay? But you can contact Sean if you're interested. You can talk to me. I've got several video demos of, of him and me going through this stuff. And um, uh, I would suggest that you definitely look forward to several cool games coming out in the future using Sean Holland's ANSI game engine. This is, in fact, the number one most exciting thing that's happening in the Pearl gaming space right now. So again, that's Sean Holland with the ANSI game engine. And with that, I am, uh, again, Will the Chill saying, can Pearl create video games? I'll go ahead and say yes. Thank you, everyone.